I am the uh, chairman of UCSF Health Hub and uh, on behalf of UCSF and uh, UCSF Health Hub and uh, MedTech Innovator and Digital.Health, um, we welcome you to our fourth of our series of um, webinars. Uh, the, the title of this webinar is really effectively How COVID Changed Everything. Our focus today is going to be how COVID changed things in orthopedics. And um, we're really excited today, especially because we have a, a pretty incredible uh, guest speaker, uh, Dr. Stefano Bini, and I will be introducing him shortly, um, who is going to be kicking off today's session. Uh, after uh, Stefano goes, uh, we're going to then uh, roll into um, a presentation by uh, Daniel Kraft. And Daniel is going to give a 15 or so minute uh, presentation on the future of, uh, of orthopedics and technology and specifically what's, uh, what COVID has done. Uh, from there, Paul Grant, who is the CEO of MedTech Innovator, is going to give his perspective on what he's seen um, as it relates to the uh, 100 plus uh, companies in the uh, 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 remote uh, patient monitoring uh, area, how they've evolved, what COVID has done. And uh, Paul will then introduce uh, four really great companies. Uh, today, our companies um, include Sword Health, Cala, Bone Health, and Sura Medical. We've picked these companies from uh, literally hundreds. Uh, we feel that these represent great companies doing amazing things uh, today in, uh, in uh, remote patient monitoring and beyond, and uh, it's really transforming orthopedics. So uh, with that, let me talk a little bit about Health Hub. Um, I'm gonna then uh, uh, take you through a bit of a video about our award show. And right from there, um, we're gonna uh, get into the meat of the presentation. And sorry about that, I have to move that around. Okay, Health Hub. So UCSF Health Hub, we are the, uh, the Innovation Center at UCSF. Um, our job at Health Hub is to connect great early stage companies or, or inventors uh, with the people, the expertise and capital that they need to uh, scale and grow whatever it is they're working on. Um, so our constituents are these um, early stage uh, funded companies that uh, are going to change the world of healthcare. Our focus has historically been digital health. Uh, we have about 12,000 or so um, members and subscribers in our network uh, in a typical day. What we're doing at Health Hub is we are uh, connecting people to, um, through our own match.com service, uh, effectively connecting them to the clinicians and the doctors and the investors that they might need. Um, what we're also is we're throwing events like this today. Um, webinars are typically if campus was open in Mission Bay, we'd be having a two or three events on campus. Um, those events could include uh, fireside chats. Uh, they could include seminars and, and, and the like. One of the things we're doing at, at uh, Health Hub that we're particularly excited about, which is what I'm gonna click right now, is we are putting on our second annual UCSF um, uh, Digital Health Award Show. And with that, I'm gonna show you a brand new video we just put together. Welcome to the second annual UCSF Digital Health Awards 2020, the Academy Awards of Digital Health, where we honor the technologies that are defining the digital health revolution. We're really excited to be part of this wonderful evening. We want to improve healthcare. It's really, really something that uh, touches me and I'm really thankful. Collaborators include all of the top healthcare innovation centers across America, over 1,000 digital health companies and innovators, 15 curated award categories, judged by the most qualified members of the healthcare innovation community from industry, academia, and government, healthcare industry thought leaders, thousands of online attendees, and 20 virtual events in anticipation of the grand finale. On September 23rd, the UCSF Digital Health Awards will continue to rewrite healthcare. Join us as we transform the future. 
So we're really, uh, that's, let me turn this guy off. Um, so we are, last thing I want to do is turn that, see that speech on Daniel Kraft, because we're going to get him shortly. Um, but uh, we're super excited about that. Um, and that's coming up. Um, that's now coming up in uh, just uh, two and a half months. So if you're a company and you're, um, you're one of our participants and you have not submitted yet for the uh, health awards, get your submission in. Um, last year, we had about uh, 600 or so uh, companies submit. This year, we're expecting uh, well over 750. Uh, we've got some great sponsors um, and it's uh, gonna be an all virtual event and uh, we're, uh, we're working hard and having a lot of fun. Um, with that, I'm going to now introduce you to Stefano Benny. Typically, uh, our guest speaker would be introduced by uh, Ralph Gonzalez, who's one of our, our four moderators who's helped us put this, uh, this uh, webinar together. But Ralph is, was called in, uh, for those of you who might know, that uh, there was an outbreak, a COVID outbreak at San Quentin, and UCSF is the, uh, we're the leading hospital system in the, in the Bay Area, and we've been taking a uh, uh, number of prisoners from San Quentin, and uh, Ralph was called in because it, uh, uh, things got a little out of, a uh, bit more out of control than we would have liked. So he apologizes that he's not here. Um, he's working hard and he wishes he was here. Um, with that, let me introduce Stefano. Uh, Stefano has basically been, yes, I know, Stefano, sorry, I do it all the time. Um, he's close to Health Hub. You saw him, you saw his picture in the video. Um, he is um, probably the uh, world leader in technology as it relates to how it's changing uh, orthopedic business. He is a, uh, um, a practicing physician at UCSF. His background comes from Kaiser. Um, at uh, UCSF, he is one of the uh, two or three technology leads and visionaries that uh, one of our go-to people at the, uh, at the hospital uh, when there's change, what should we do? And we know who to call. So uh, we thought for our fourth um, and last webinar, we save the best for last. And we have a really great speaker who's going to really set the scene, what's going on in orthopedics, how is technology changing things, and then what did COVID basically do? And with that, I'm going to basically uh, hand it over to, uh, to Stefano. It's all well, you. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. I'll uh, share my screen for the talk and uh, appreciate being part of this really exciting series of lectures. Um, as uh, you can see here, um, we're sort of talking about the hospital home webinars. This is a tele-ortho, if you will. I'm, a, I'm the chief technology officer in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at UCSF. I'm also the founder and chair of the UCSF Digital Orthopedics Conference, San Francisco, and the chair of the Digital Health and Social Media Committee for the American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons. And when, in the context of our conference, we'll also partner with the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery. I only tell you that because orthopedic surgery and digital health are starting to come together in many ways. And I'm gonna show you a little bit of that. Joined today uh, as part of the Team MSK, Musculoskeletal Team for, for Team Health Hub, I'm gonna be joined by Daniel Kraft. Now, um, I'm, we decided to, to divide the world of technology into two basic halves. I'm going to talk about the boring stuff, is the way we deliver care, the infrastructure, the system level stuff, the, man, the way we actually do the care models. Whereas Daniel's going to do what he does best, just talk about the fancy new technology that's out there, how it's going to help us, and where the, his vision will show us where it will go in the future. And I picked this particular picture of Daniel at a science fair because something happened he is exactly the same today as he was back then, which is proof that either if you dabble in technology, you too can avoid aging, or he fell in a tub of formalin as a young child. Either way, you'll see him yourself. you see how he has aged <laughs> incredibly well. Um, so what happened with telehealth? It was a revolution that was a bit stuck. You can argue that the HIPAA law is written in 1996 before we had end-to-end -end encryption. We're really stifling our ability to transmit information. The digital services were subject to state jurisdictions and not federal. And there are many other reasons, including payment models, that simply weren't letting this thing take off. And that included in the musculoskeletal space. Then came COVID, and with that came a significant expansion of telehealth initiatives across the world, really across the United States, prompting 
Stephen Clasco, the CEO of Jefferson, to call it healthcare's Amazon moment, the concept that was widely quoted in, the, in, in that period of time frame uh, because of his role as a distinguished fellow at the World Economic Forum at a time where his hospital system was seeing as many as 600 visits, televisits per day, for which they are very proud, while we at UCSF were already doing 2,500 televisits per day. As you can see from this graph, the uptick in the adoption of telehealth visits was very rapid at UCSF. Why was we, were we able to do so? We were able to do so because we had invested in the infrastructure necessary to deploy telehealth well in advance of arrival of COVID and already had the infrastructure in place based largely by linkage between our electronic health record and the Zoom platform, which remains our current uh, telehealth platform. And then that probably was related to the massive zoom and the stock price of this particular company. But this is also the story of the stock price for many companies serving this space. What happened in orthopedics? We went from a relatively negligible use of telehealth visits uh, in Q1 2019, for example, to a massive increase uh, as COVID hit. And this is a graph of the percentage of all the visits within orthopedics, specifically in this case, my clinic orthoplasty, and not my clinic, our, my, our group of orthoplasty surgeons, going, up, going close to 100% very consistently through the middle of May. At which point though, something interesting happened, which is worth discussing, which is as we opened up our clinics and started seeing patients in person again, the number of patients choosing to come in versus choosing to have telehealth visits uh, was remarkably in favor of coming in, something we probably would not have predicted. All of those of us who are such fans of telehealth technology assumed that the ability to not come into clinics and to be able to uh, not travel in would have, you know, would have been uh, a sticky factor. It turned out to be not quite the case, at least in this, age, in this uh, time frame. Now let me shift a little bit to the technologies that we've used to enhance our ability to care for patients, the way we deliver care, that have transitioned very nicely actually to the virtual model. This is a, a slide of what happened after we implemented Luma Health, which is a technology that allows us to uh, basically replace a call center outreach with automated SMS texting messages to patients. And you can see that very quickly, we had a massive decrease in the number of empty slots in our clinics. Now, we are actually writing a research paper around this, looking at exact impact and how it happened, but at the very high level, we had a 15% increase in clinic utilization rates, which has a very defined ROI, which is a very hard thing to get in healthcare when you're deploying technology. You have to find things that can actually increase revenue to cover the cost of the technology, and this is a great example of that. Not only that, if you look at the number of of uh, touch points that are required to increase that amount, uh, that, that clinic visit by this amount, it was in the thousands. Imagine making those phone calls as opposed to text messages, it really wouldn't have happened. So this is technology truly solving problems that we have. Another interesting point that I wanna make here, and I'm not even sure if I'm allowed to show this data because it's kind of raw, but it is interesting because we all have this assumption, just like we assumed that once people had a taste of telehealth, they stick with it, maybe not so true. The other thing we had the assumptions was that older people don't do telehealth. And the truth is if you give them options like complicated tasks on cell phones, like self-scheduling, actually the, the percentage of patients adopting these technologies is not defined by age. It may be defined by culture, by social milieu, by access to the internet, but in the context of an educated population with access to the internet, we're not seeing age being an issue, an important topic to consider. Another issue around televisits was always the question of payment. With the issue, with the, with the onset of payment reform, if you will, with the arrival of payments for telehealth services, we now need to find a way to collect those funds. And this is where you're seeing some fintech companies coming into healthcare, aiding in this in this place, which you may not know is up to 60 to 70% of referrals that come into a clinic like ours actually are missing the insurance information. What this technology does, it goes out, reaches out to the patients, collects insurance information, calculates the payments, collects the payments, whether it's a prepay or the copay, and uh, manages all that in the background before the patient either hits the clinic, which is a very, very powerful tool. 
Another problem we have with delivering care to patients at home who may be remote or who may be even be in our clinics and come to see us is the fact that we're still a facts-based healthcare system. And that creates tremendous number of challenges in getting the information not only to the clinic, but then print it to the physician who may not be coming to clinics anymore, right? They're not, we're not coming to the office as much as we used to. Now these delays in getting these documents signed, then they have to be rescanned and sent back. We actually partner with DocuSign at UCSF to see what would happen if we had those scanned documents go directly into an inbox, being virtually signed and sent back virtually to the lender, to the to the people who send us the external organizations, and we've had excellent results with that, with 100% acceptance of these of these forms, shortening the cycle time for delivery of care. Very very powerful tools. Again, not new to the planet, extremely new to healthcare. We're way way behind. Let's shift a little bit now to orthopedic surgery, which is the bulk of the work that we do. The clinics are the volume, but the bulk of the financial aspect of it is with the surgery. And what you see here is a worldwide the COVID impact has had a massive uh, impact on access to surgical services, particularly elective services. The only group that's been somewhat mm, helped, but not entirely, is or is um, cancer surgery. But all the other elective stuff has been put on hold. As many as 73% of all surgeries canceled, 72%. And what that means in orthopedics is in those three months of the peak of the economic crisis, something like 6.3 million orthopedic surgeries were canceled worldwide. And the United States, that is absolutely true. The American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery sent out a, a survey and they, the membership sent back uh, that an average of a third of patients postponed surgery by more than three months. Now, when you're looking at that massive amount of information uh, of cancellations, you need to understand the tools that are necessary to drive to manage that. Partnering with that is a massive shift from inpatient to outpatient surgery. It's been triggered by some changes in Medicare laws. This is particularly true of hip and knee replacement, which, which I do, but is already part of the largest shift in, in hand and shoulder and arthroscopy and all these other stuff that we do in orthopedics into the outpatient arena. Now the outpatient arena is interesting because that means that a patient that normally we'd have 24 hours, a day or two to manage in the hospital now is going back home with the same needs that we per previously were managing in the hospital now have to be managed instead at home. And so there's a lot of opportunity for technologies that help us support those uh, patients in the home once they go from these uh, uh, these outpatient surgery units, which have become extremely popular with patients who are not very excited about heading into hospitals that are considered to be COVID centers. And so there's a kind of a large shift into these what are perceived to be safer environments. This is one technology that we're using or we're implementing at UCSF, DocSpare, there are others in this space that are surgical scheduling platforms. What make this one interesting is the fact that embedded within this technology, they have a machine learning uh, natural language processing platform, which allows the software to read through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of patients in our backlog to figure out which ones are actually available for surgery because the checklist has been completed for the preoperative care models. So there's one small element of this particular company we like, but anything that allows us to manage these technologies will also help us, excuse me, to manage patients uh, who are canceling or who are rescheduling is gonna help us do a better job managing those patients. Another technology that we already had in place that has helped us a great deal as we went into COVID and coming out of COVID are anything, are these patient engagement platforms. We happen to use Health Loop. There are several others. It's now called Get Well Loop. These companies are signing up new customers everywhere. 70 new customers in two months. I happen to know they had something like seven in two years previously. And the reason for it is that these are platforms that have that established two-way communication between our physicians and patients during very difficult times, either the preoperative phase, lots of questions, or the immediate post-operative phase during recovery, where again, a lot of questions comes up. And going through electronic health records or phone calls is simply too problematic. And I'm sure Daniel will talk to us a bit more also about where this technology is going, especially with the advent of chatbots. So in summary, and before I turn it over to my buddy Daniel, who's now available to us, is that what are the trends that I see in the orthopedic delivery model of care? The MSK space was largely spared from the clinical aspects of COVID-19. I don't, they didn't go into it earlier, but it's pretty obvious. There's, but there was a massive shift to virtual care during lockdown 
that is largely reversed. I've been in touch with leaders across the healthcare system across the United States, and they're seeing the same patterns. Large healthcare systems, large orthopedic centers across the nation are seeing a drop in the utilization of virtual care that's largely patient-driven. Technology designed to optimize workflow in the ambulatory clinic is very successful in the virtual environment. It's actually managing the same problems, and so we're not seeing uh, those investments becoming negli uh, becoming irrelevant. They're actually becoming more relevant. Uh, the, the, the impact of COVID-19 on surgical cancellations that happened in the spring that may again happen over the next two months as the COVID epidemic overwhelms our healthcare system uh, will cre create demand for technologies to support surgical scheduling. It is a very complex thing and, to, and if anything that helps us not re redo the same thing over and over again will be quite helpful. And lastly, the growth in outpatient surgery, which predates COVID and certainly is being accelerated by it, will also drive a lot of hospital care to home uh, adoption of technologies that I uh, expect you'll hear more of from Daniel. And with this last slide, if it's okay, Mark, a quick pitch for the Digital Orthopedics Conference San Francisco. As you can see at the top, we've gone virtual and you can see the impact we have with our events is quite broad. We do reach a worldwide audience. We have a, a very well-designed on-demand library for any of these uh, uh, of the talks that we had in the context of orthopedic care and technology around COVID. Why does this matter? Most people don't realize that musculoskeletal is approximately 20% of the US healthcare spend. It is not a small vertical. It's actually one of the largest verticals in healthcare after chronic disease management. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my friend, Dr. Kraft, to discuss the technical, technological innovations that affect the care itself, the care we deliver, and uh, that enable us to move forward and rethink the way we, we think about this orthopedic musculoskeletal paradigm. So if you'd like to follow me on LinkedIn or Twitter, please do, and uh, I'll take questions afterwards. Thank you, Mark. I hope that's what you're looking for. Excellent. Daniel, all you. Great. Thank you, Stefanos. Thank you, Mark. I'm not sure, Stefano, you found a picture from my high school science fair, but uh, be that as it may. Thanks. Um, very crafty. Uh, I'm very crafty. Just, it was just last year, I think. Uh, I skipped everything else. Um, great to be back with you all here. This is our well, amazing, our fourth and final segment on Hospital to Home. Um, and now my challenge as not an orthopedic surgeon uh, is to try and frame some of uh, what's happening related to hospital home and technology in the orthopedic and musculoskeletal space. Um, and, and clearly uh, these issues are shifting and changing in their level of need as the pandemic advances. And we can argue what stage of the wave we're in, uh, but obviously things are moving quickly and uh, COVID has disrupted many businesses and is catalyzing, as we discussed in these series, many sometimes positive things uh, for the current and future of, of health and medicine and beyond. And our theme again is a lot of what used to take a formal clinical setting is going from hospital to hospital. And obviously a lot of um, orthopedic care still needs an operating room, but a lot of the other elements around uh, orthopedics and musculoskeletal care can, can move to the home and to mobile. Um, so part of the thematics, and I've talked about this before, is we've still got old technologies, fax machines, clipboards, CD-ROMs. Uh, we're still stuck in waiting rooms. That's shifted in our now more virtualized age. Uh, we're starting to not just have silos, but converge with silos across different specialties. Um, we're moving from our sick care model of intermittent and reactive uh, sick care to one of being much more continuous and proactive and personalized. And I think that particularly does apply not just to things like cancer and, and uh, heart disease, but to the uh, musculoskeletal space. And the idea here is that now we're not just living long time, but we'll have long quality of life. And as someone who just developed plantar fasciitis, even small little challenges musculoskeletally can, can have a big impact on your quality of life. So health span. So, um, you know, I chair a program called Exponential Medicine. I like to think about where technology is and where it's heading. Stefano and others have been very involved in that program. And I would challenge all of you, not just to think about the technologies here in 2020, but where we are on this uh, cusp of, of shifting things going forward. And part of that, of course, can ride the internet and medical things, uh, 5G, et cetera, is already here. Um, and, but it needs to be technology aligned with the incentives. And Stefano uh, well laid out some of the challenges in the COVID era, but the best technology or best device or digital or app is only gonna work if we align the value settings and how we pay and reimburse these things. So all of this needs to come together. And uh, clearly part of the incentive is to bring care from the hospital uh, to our home, to our mobile devices, to anywhere we may go. Uh, to the corner pharmacy. And of course, we've talked in earlier episodes about this digitization. Um, and I think orthopedics and musculoskeletal is ripe for integrating this. And we'll see some examples of where that is. 
as these technologies converge. So let's start with some of the prevention side of things. We're just learning from our new world of internet of medical things. Clearly we can censor all sorts of elements, including uh, from the basics of our Fitbit to just using our, our phone as a sensor to pick up changes in gait, maybe who's at risk for a fall. Um, from any sort of wearable today, you can tell who's actually wearing it um, and if they're having significant changes in their gait. Um, the sensors are evolving in all sorts of interesting ways. Um, and you know, the Fitbit's only been with us for about 11 years, but some, some great work by Stefano and others have shown that you can just use small data, right? Are you walking more and doing great after your Stefano's knee replacement or hip replacement? He's great, all of his patients do great. Or might you not be doing so well? And just look at that small data of, of, of less steps per day as a, as, a, as a sort of simple biomarker. And we can start to use these sort of digital flow to both uh, measure and optimize our health, musculoskeletal and otherwise, to diagnose a problem early. Uh, it could be hip dysplasia uh, or other elements, all the way to when someone's left uh, the hospital or the outpatient facility to manage their therapy with smarter feedback loops. And there's sometimes uh, fun, simple things. We all now have smartphone neck uh, from looking at our laptops and smartphones. This interesting uh, spin off at uh, Israel called Upright. It's a little sensor on your back. It's like your digital mother and can basically quantify your posture and give you actually a buzz on your back that reminds you to sit up straight about a week of wearing this retrains your physiology and can have significant benefits to something as common as lower back pain or might be useful in uh, post-op surgical elements. Sensors are clearly starting to integrate into implants that can give clues to their longevity. Are they well fitted? Uh, how's that patient doing? Uh, we're seeing plenty of examples of sensors coming to our clothes, which certainly relate to our ability to move or pick up folks like diabetics who might have fit ulcers and pick up challenges early. Or out of Korea, Welt, the smart belt, uh, is, is showing uh, who's likely to have risk of a fall, which like might lend, then lead, lend to a future model where you have a, a belt with a protectable in it, uh, essentially an airbag. Maybe not so practical, but an idea of where wearables can go. And then in the era of sort of rehab, Exosystems has developed tools that can quantify and help augment rehabilitation all the way to the severe end, exoskeletons you might wear in the setting of someone who is paraplegic, exobionics out of Berkeley is a great example of pioneering that space and we may see things not just for the folks who have disability, but to super enable someone who needs to lift boxes, uh, uh, super enable their upper limbs, et cetera, a few varieties coming out uh, in those categories as well. And then there's sort of the uh, sports and exercise realm where there's some interesting convergence of technologies. Uh, my friend, Dr. Jeff Fleisch, she's an anesthesiologist at a standard for to the technology called Counterpace. Uh, as you're running, essentially, interestingly, uh, when you hit the ground, uh, you have more afterload when you hit with your feet. So if you time your heart rate to when you hit your ground on the, on, on the ground while you're running or biking, it can dramatically improve uh, preload back to your heart and dramatically improve exercise efficiency. So that's kind of a combination of digital sensors and uh, musculoskeletal activity. Or you may use cameras now to detect motion while you're doing a yoga element, just from a simple camera with, with AI and plenty of apps coming into that space. Or monitor patients. Are they upright? Have they had a fall? All from simple cameras, tracking their eating, their drinking, their posture, uh, or their gait. And then Wi-Fi can be modified as well to track activity and movement uh, up to many people in the same space. So lots of new modalities to sort of be invisible to quantify our health, our mo mobility, et cetera, um, that can be used to track a, a patient uh, for prevention, diagnostics, or therapy. So again, the challenge for this, if you're an orthopedic surgeon, a primary care doc, a physical therapist, is what do you do with all this data? Sometimes there's a bit of the big brother element. Uh, some health and life insurance companies are are lowering premiums if you walk more steps, which might lead to a situation where people may pay you to put steps in the Fitbit, might be a bit extreme. Uh, but you know these can be measured, uh, optimized to optimize our behavior or to save ourselves if we may have had a fall and no one else is there to, to call 911. This has been done uh, with Apple Watch in the recent uh, past. The challenge, whether you're a patient uh, or a clinician is how do you synthesize this data? We're in the era of digital coaching, a variety of versions now like uh, Soul Machines out of New Zealand where you can have your personal coach that's tuned to your age and your personality and who and might help you through your physical therapy or your mental health issues, your cardiovascular disease. And again, at the synthesis of these things as we unsilo many elements of healthcare. And a lot of this, of course, can happen on voice. Uh, Stefano mentioned health loop, which is a, a great example of using feedback loops and digital empathy to ask the patient how they're doing. Do they have any swelling or edema? Uh, to use that as a dashboard that goes back to the clinician 
to make a start dashboard, enable the patient to self-track their wound, and again, give the clinical team a dashboard of multiple patients uh, to be much more proactive in a, in a feedback loop generating manner that's already demonstrated lots of value. There are lots of new tools coming to, uh, I think, augment clinical care in the inpatient and outpatient setting. Of course, on the fancy side, we have next generation HoloLens, which can provide uh, great information to the surgeon, the radiologist, um, versions of augmented reality have now been adapted to enable overlapping clinical data. I tried an early version of this Augmetics platform out of Israel. Uh, they've recently got FDA approval now for a surgical navigation system. So if you're doing something like a spinal fusion, can, you can literally be guided through the steps, see through the patient and have a faster, better, um, uh, hopefully better outcome and lower cost procedure. And again, they just got FDA guidance on that back in December. So really interesting fusions of technology. Virtual reality on the extreme is fun for riding a roller coaster, but also is showing pretty good benefits in physical therapy. A lot of folks have orthopedic procedures, don't do their PT, now they can go home and, uh, and move their hips, their arms, their neck, and do that in a gamified way. It's tracked, it goes back to the physical therapist uh, and can be used in a variety of powerful ways. Or before you have the procedure, you can go into a VR environment and relax. Uh, that can lower stress levels uh, or help you through uh, 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 both yoga or maybe uh, physical workouts where you're lifting weights, but in a much more engaging space. And we're seeing examples of VR AR platforms uh, with things like the mirror and, and beyond. Of course, for surgical education or medical education, VR is quite a service or to have someone come in virtually coach you through a procedure. And it could be a regular clinic, but again, to bring other experts in with you in the clinical environment. And where I think this is gonna take us is a bit of a ways for clinicians, orthopedic surgeons and beyond, where we can learn from other uh, procedures. Thousands of them can be recorded in real time, can be censored, and potentially sort of give that kind of ways and AI-assisted surgical decision-making in real time as we move forward. So just like we have driver assist, we're gonna sort of have surgical assist uh, in many procedural uh, specialties, including orthopedics. And eventually some of this can become much more autonomous and do some of the elements of procedures that a robot can do better even than humans today. Um, education blends with uh, VR as, as well. Many of you know uh, um, uh, OsoVR started by an orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Justin Barad, a great example of now, not just sort of blending video games with orthopedics, but now they've been able to show by, they can much more quickly and much more uh, effectively train surgeons or even uh, lay people to do procedures. You can practice, you can fail, just like a flight simulator for, for pilots. And I think this will become the standard for many elements across healthcare. And then where can we go with diagnostics in orthopedics and musculoskeletal and beyond? We have new digital kits that can simply be a camera and again, measure gait or simple wearables that might, up, might pick up problems early. And now the ability to sort of connect the dots between these sorts of platforms. We're using AI meets radiology meets orthopedics now in ways where you may not need to wait for the official radiology report to get uh, insights into radiology exams. We can use AI meets mobile for wound care, healthy.io, uh, which I'm on the board of out, of out of Tel Aviv, is now using your smartphone to look at wounds, which is certainly applicable in orthopedic and other procedures. Again, to do that at home so the visiting nurse or the patient themselves can track their wounds. And finally, in therapy, there's a lot of digital elements coming. Of course, the chatbot element is, is potentially key that can be used for pre-op, for post-op, for the health loop type of elements. The virtual visit is gonna go well beyond what we have on our sort of FaceTime type screen to feel like you're in a virtual environment. I did a VR element on my uh, Oculus with my cousin last week. We're watching a movie together. It can also be a clinical type experience in the near future. And then an array of course of digiceuticals that we can start to prescribe for many applications. I mentioned before, I'm, I'm launching a platform called digital.health. That's a website, digital.health, where you'll be able to find uh, devices and platforms for orthopedics like exo rehab or wearables that might be applicable for certain patients that you might want to prescribe, whether it's an app, a pharmaceutical, or software solution. And then, of course, there's this exciting era that's not really new now, but really ramping up of 3D printing, whether it's 3D printing a personalized uh, Im implant that really matches the individual, uh, all the way to personalizing a very unique, a company called Unique, prosthetic that can match the, the patient's uh, style and color and tattoos. Uh, in fact, Unique's also moved into the era of, of um, not just uh, prosthetics, but for scoliosis, uh, uh, a wearable, in this case, for most of the young women with scoliosis is a brace that's printed in tune to that young woman. And it can also add on gamification with sensors so that they can track how often they're using it and use that sort of digitization to blend device uh, behavior elements and feedback and even make it stylish. 
Um, and now they're blending that with mobile where you can scan the normal leg and just send the file in and print the prosthetic or the, or the uh, matching uh, case that might be needed. So this whole sort of blend of scan, print, modify, print, all is being enabled on our smart mobile devices and a whole, whole realm of elements where orthopedics and musculoskeletal is being impacted all the way down to printing your orthotic or your sports shoe. Um, and finally, blending that with robotics. Someone may have lost mobility or had a, a plastics or hand procedure are gonna increasingly blend personalization moving forward. We can even now 3D print on the space station, hard to get medical devices up there. And so if an astronaut breaks their finger, we could print one on orbit or later on the moon and Mars. Finally, I think what this all comes together, of course, is the era of discovery. Uh, we need to do smarter clinical trials, smarter sharing. Uh, we can run orthopedic related clinical trials, di digital clinical trials, drug trials and beyond on these new digital, digital rails, bringing you know, clinical trials from hospital to home as well. So um, I encourage all of us to download clinical trials, become not just an organ donor, but a data donor. Uh, we'll hopefully have medical share buttons across our, our platforms going forward. And again, I think the theme of this entire hospital of the home, including orthopedics, cardiovascular, oncology that we've covered in the last few weeks is this convergence of all these technologies that are getting exponentially cheaper, faster, more available, easier to use, easier to, to, to bring together, to solve, whether that's using botting sensing, cameras, crowdsourcing, VR, Internet of Things, analytics, big data, all of them are now really ripe for re leveraging for our reinvention of health and medicine, not just for today, but skating to where the puck is going to be. So. Um, uh, thanks very much. You can find me on Twitter, uh, track me at Exponential Medicine, which will be virtually this fall. And uh, I encourage all of you to keep uh, innovating as we uh, reshape health and medicine across the spectrum. Thanks. I'll try and stop. Excellent. 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 Paul, it's all you. Over to Paul for some startups. Thank you. Uh, thank you both. Uh, so hi, everyone. I'm Paul Grand. I'm the CEO at MedTech Innovator. Uh, MedTech Innovator is an accelerator for medical technology, which I'm going to tell you about in a moment. Um, but I would just want to comment on the fact that this series has been fantastic. I've been really happy to be part of this. Uh, we've had four terrific um, episodes, including this one. Uh, you know, this one is looking to be uh, to be a great way to end it. So very excited about this, and it's been fantastic to be part of this team putting this together. So let me tell you a little bit about um, MedTech Innovator and why. Uh, why we should be thinking about technology that's coming down the pipe and why it's really important to understand this stuff. Um, I'm Paul Grant. I mentioned over here, you see in the bottom, my uh, at Life Science VC, that's me on Twitter, uh, Paul at medtechinnovator.org, if you would like to reach me by email. And MedTech Innovator is really unique in that we see more medical technology than pretty much any other accelerator that I know of. Uh, we have 258 companies that have been through MedTech Innovator. Uh, we have another 82 companies that are part of our current cohort. So uh, that number is going to go up quite a bit at the end of this year. 54 products have been brought to the market by alumni of MedTech Innovator. And those companies have gone on to raise $1.7 billion in follow-on funding, which is pretty terrific. Um, we're a partnership of a number of the large companies in the med tech industry, companies like Johnson & Johnson and Olympus and Baxter and so on, Edwards, et cetera, who want to see innovative medical technology actually reach patients. So we're out there as a nonprofit trying to find these technologies and making sure that the best ones actually make it to patients. Uh, we just got the news uh, a couple of days ago from Silicon Valley Bank that we are the largest accelerator of medical devices in the world. Uh, we eclipse everybody else. And as I mentioned, we have another 82 companies about to add on to this. So we're going to be kind of off the scale shortly. And I give you that as a, as a reference point, because when we talk about data that I'm going to mention now, um, I just want to give you the sense that we're seeing quite a bit of the innovation that's coming down the road. Um, and what I'm showing you over these next several slides are innovative technologies that have applied to MedTech Innovator over the last three years. So uh, 2018, 19, and 20. Uh, and giving you a slice of just the companies that are in the musculoskeletal space. So, uh, or orthopedics, as we say here on the slide. <laughs> uh, and unless you think these are just technologies that are, you know, at some university and someone's coming up with an idea. No, 41% of the people that we're talking about um, are already approved or on the market. So, you know, the large number of these companies are, are here and, and coming very soon. Um, if we break down the companies that are in this sector, 63% uh, of them are a device related technology and 61% also have a digital component. So super supportive of the things you just heard from Stefano and from, 
from Daniel, these are digital enabled technologies. Um, and when we look within that, um, for the, some of the different themes, I've highlighted some here on the slide. Um, as Stefano said, you know, we want to we want to get these technologies um, more efficiently to, to to patients and have more efficient care. So efficiency, not surprisingly, 65% of the companies um, that we're seeing are in the are adding efficiencies. 39% are adding some kind of a service. 29% are adding something in the remote care space. So you know, this is a big trend. These are things that you're going to see continuing. Um, on. It's also nice to see, I didn't highlight it on the screen here, but satisfaction, you know, the companies are trying to increase satisfaction of patients is extremely important for hospitals. So this is something I think we'll continue to see. And then we look at the device categories. So within, within the devices of them, um, I'm highlighted some of the ones here, 23% uh, of them are some kind of a disposable or single use technology. 20% are instrumentation and 20% are surgical tools. I think we're going to continue seeing things like that in terms of trends. Um, and then when we look at the diagnostic categories, which is a smaller subset, 20% of them are point of care. Um, we didn't have a home care category. I think we would have seen a number of them in that category had we put that. Um, and then within digital, as you might expect, mobile first um, is true here in orthopedics. So in this category, 40% of the technologies that we that were applying to us are in uh, you know, are somehow mobile enabled. 45% of them are incorporating artificial intelligence and machine learning. You know, again, not surprising listening to Daniel's presentation, but good to see the actual numbers. 21% um, of them have some telemedicine component. So you know, you're talking about digitally enabled, artificially intelligent, mobile technologies that are designed to be used in the home. I mean, this is pretty incredible stuff. So now that I've given you a little bit of a, an idea of kind of like what the pipeline looks like for technologies that are coming along, we're gonna highlight four companies you free today that are here, that are real, that have their technologies that are, that are being used in patients and they can tell you what the impact is and how these are gonna really impact care. Um, so these four companies are gonna give short presentations. Um, there'll be no Q and A immediately following the presentations. We're going to save that for breakout sessions that we do after all four have completed their presentations. You'll be assigned to a breakout room. Um, you'll hear more about that where you have a chance to ask some questions. And then separately, there'll be additional Q&A time with each of these companies that you can go into if you're interested in learning more about their technologies. Perhaps if you're a clinician and you want to understand how to access these technologies or a hospital, um, if you're a patient, if you're interested in the technologies, if you're an investor, whatever it might be, these are some companies that you need to know. So I'm going to go in order here as you see them on the screen. First up, I'm going to bring up Dan Burnett. So he's the founder and CEO of Bone Health Technologies. Uh, he's going to tell you about their, their technology for osteoporosis, which is, a which is an area, unfortunately, that many of us will be affected by. So I'm very glad to hear that Dan is working on this. So Dan, you want to tell us about Bone Health? Great. Yeah. Thanks. <clears throat> thanks for having us, Paul. And thanks, uh, Mark and everybody for inviting us to this. Again, I think this has been a, um, a great um, a venue and it's been an overall really excellent series of seminars. So pulling up my PowerPoint presentation now. Um, <clears throat> so Bone Health Technologies is the name of our company and it's based on, uh, it is a technology based on um, NASA technology developed um, by Dr. Clint Rubin for the astronauts in order to prevent bone loss and, and to improve back pain in um, astronauts in space. Two big problems when they're uh, been in uh, low gravity situations for a while. So Dr. Clint Rubin was conscripted by NASA to go um, develop a technology for these astronauts and he ended up with a vibrating plate that he put on the space station <clears throat> and had bands that pulled the astronauts into the plate to simulate gravity. And those bands then, um, and, the, and the vibrating plate itself was able to simulate uh, weight bearing exercise. And he was able to show that there was a bump in their uh, M cell markers of bone formation and a drop in uh, markers of osteoclast activity. So I will share um, Bone Health Technologies deck with you now. <clears throat> So um, our, te our technology is designed to prevent osteoporosis or treat osteopenia. Massive market, there's uh, one in two women um, 
one in two women and one in four men will suffer, uh, uh, over the age of 50, will suffer an osteoporosis-related fracture, hip and spine fractures, um, uh, 300,000 hip per year and 700,000 spine uh, per year and costing $19 billion to the U.S. healthcare system. The um, estimated, uh, and there's 54 million Americans total, 14 million of those are osteoporosis for which drugs are applicable. Uh, 40 million are osteopenia, and that's just um, a condition that is not currently approved for any drugs. Current treatments for osteoporosis, there's pharmacological, calcium and vitamin D supplements and high impact exercise. Pharmacologic have side effects um, that may result in their discontinuation within, um, by 75% of patients within 12 months. They also have atyp they have also have severe side effects like jaw necrosis and the fracture you see above in the radiograph. That's an atypical, that's a femoral fracture um, that is uh, associated with bisphosphonate use. Calcium and vitamin D supplements are useful only if you're deficient in those. If you're not deficient, then they provide no benefit. So the only thing that's available for osteopenia right now is high impact exercise. High impact exercise though isn't just walking, it's jumping jacks or, or running at high speed, which the average adult can't do. Our device <clears throat> sits over the um, sacrococcygeal region and vibrates the two areas that need the um, acceleration the most, the hips and spine, lower spine. This is a similar vibrational frequency as Clint Rubin used on the NASA technology. And in a preliminary study that we've done, funded by the NIH, we've shown that uh, there was a 14% decrease in NTX, a bone loss biomarker, with our treatment. All 17 women experienced a decrease, and the average decrease was 14%, something similar to what you see with high impact exercise. Uh, these are our financial projections. We expect to close our Series A in the next couple months. We are a little over half subscribed so far. And year one involves us selling the device as a consumer product based on the data that we have in our clinical study. And year two um, and three are our continuation of that until we actually have FDA clearance in year four. This is the team. Together, we've all brought about eight products to market and have had two successful exits uh, in something similar to, uh, and Gabe Griego is our marketing guy who's done similar technologies that are consumer and health. Lastly, we have 2.2 million in non-dilutive funding. That's how we're funding our pivotal study right now of 140 women uh, with, us, with low bone density. Year long longitudinal study, we're half enrolled and we're raising a two and a half million dollar series A. So that's it. Great. Terrific, thank you very much. Dan, no problem. Um, so we've got your slides off. All right, and, and Dan, uh, Dan is an amazing guy to know in general, and as it comes in terms of medical innovation, he runs a, an incubator called Theranova uh, that really has produced some pretty incredible technologies and has a whole pipeline behind it. So great guy to know. You should message him in the chat if you want to learn more about that as well as bone health. All right, thanks next up. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, well, thanks a lot. Absolutely, Dan. Uh, all right, so next up, uh, Kate Rosenbluth is going to tell us about Cala Health. Um, Cala Health. And uh, it is a really amazing company in terms of its ability to, to treat all sorts of different things that we would normally treat with drugs, perhaps, um, but now with electroceuticals. Um, and so she'll tell you about that and neuromodulation and how she's making an impact in essential tremor. So, Kate. Perfect. Thanks. Are you able to see my slides? You are. Okay, great. Well, many thanks for the invitation to present and uh, um, to the organizers for your great leadership uh, in this unique time. Uh, I'm Kate Rosenbluth. I'm founder and chief scientific officer at Kella Health. And today what I thought I would focus on was walking you through how our team is continuing to serve uh, patients during the pandemic. So what you can see here is our first therapy launched to market, uh, Kella Trio over there on the left. Uh, like many of the other technologies highlighted by Dr. Daniel Kraft, uh, TRIO has motion sensors on board to measure patients' movement. But it's first and foremost a therapeutic device. So this device actually stimulates nerves accessible at the wrist uh, to treat hand tremors from a condition called essential tremor. Uh, the motion sensors in this case are used to calibrate therapy for each patient's unique physiology. Uh, and Acala were also active in cardiology and psychiatry. So TRIO is a prescription therapy. It's cleared by the FDA. It was cleared on the de novo pathway, uh, and it is commercially available in the United States. So today what I'm going to walk through is this unique patient-centered care model uh, that you can see here on the right. So the first step in this flywheel uh, is informing the patient. 
Uh, in this case, uh, empowering them with information about why their hands shake, about why uh, it can be so difficult to do things that many people take for granted, like drinking from a cup or, or signing a check, uh, writing a note to a friend. The next step here is the prescription. So uh, it's likely that many of you joining today might have used telemedicine for the first time in these past months. Um, there's no question that COVID has probably advanced the scale of telemedicine, you know, around 10 to 15 years. Um, as has been discussed today, I think that this trend is likely to pull back from its recent high, recent high but you know, beyond that, clearly, uh, um, I, I believe it will continue to serve a greater portion than prior to the pandemic. So whether a physician sees a patient in person or by telemedicine, we make it easy for them to send the prescription directly to Cala, and then we drop ship therapy directly to the patient's doorstep. And I would say that like telemedicine, this direct delivery of medical therapies is really another area where I think healthcare has really rapidly adapted uh, to this time of shelter at home uh, and is likely to have impact long beyond the pandemic. So patients open the box, they put on the device uh, like a wristwatch, and as I mentioned earlier, motion sensors on the device calibrate the therapy to the patient's unique tremor. Uh, stimulation then sends signals along the median and radial nerve, as you see here, to the same location in the brain where neurosurgeons implant deep brain stimulators. So coming full circle, this motion data also serves patients, I'd say, as a group, as well as empowering each patient on an individual level. This graph shows the average improvement uh, across more than 20,000 sessions of therapy used by more than 200 patients uh, at 26 sites in one of our recent studies, uh, including uh, UCSF, who has been a, a, great, uh, a great partner in bringing these therapies forward to patients. In addition to supporting uh, clinical translation, these type of insights, these motion-driven insights, provide each patient with information on their unique tremor as well as on how therapy uh, works best for them. And I really believe that this integration of therapy and diagnostics is the future of patient-centered care. So to wrap up, uh, COVID-19 has forever reshaped healthcare delivery. Um, many of these innovations are likely to long outlive the pandemic uh, and continue serving patients with you know, convenient, affordable, and effective care at home. So thanks to the organizers uh, for their leadership and inviting me to share our approach. And if you want to keep the conversation going, uh, you can see the virtual social Zoom ID for just afterwards and my contact information is up there as well. Thanks. Great. Hey, uh, really, really fascinating technology, a company that's really pioneering this space. Uh, if you want to learn more about that, definitely go visit with Kate afterwards. Uh, and she can even tell you too about the uh, the inspiration for this and you know how she even got started in this space at Stanford Biodesign. So lots more to talk about. Uh, next up, we're gonna bring up Rick Bieberman. Uh, Rick Bieberman is with Sierra Medical and you heard Dan talk all about augmented reality. Uh, Rick is gonna tell you about a company that's doing it. So Great. Rick. Thanks, can you hear me okay? We can. Yeah, and you can see the slides? We can. Yeah, listen, thanks everyone. I'm Rick Bieberman. I'm CEO of Sierra Medical. We're developing augmented reality software to help clinicians with pre-surgical planning by providing them with patient-specific holograms that have been derived from the same data used to generate a conventional CT scan or MRI. Our images are, are meant to be used in place of CTs and MRIs, and we provide far greater anatomical clarity. So we, we've all been there. We've had a child at the playground playing on the monkey bars. She falls, hurts herself, and has to head to the emergency room. A CT scan at the emergency room reveals an elbow fracture with a number of bone fragments. And for surgeons, putting those bone fragments back in the right place is like putting a jigsaw puzzle together. And often, many of these fragments fail to show up on either CTs or MRIs. And this lack of anatomical clarity causes big problems for surgeons because it requires them to make a number of critical decisions on the fly during surgery with the patient under anesthesia. Surgeons know there, if they don't get it right, there are big consequences, malunions, deformities, surgery redos, just to name a few. In fact, this concept of hidden or unexpected anatomy accounts for 25% of all errors in surgery. And for patients, this means much greater risk of complications. For surgeons, it means lack of confidence in their surgical plan, inaccurate measurements, and inefficient image review. And for hospitals and health systems, it means significant inefficiencies 
in how they staff and resource their operating rooms. So imagine, if you will, using an augmented reality model to get a much better sense of this elbow fracture and then being able to virtually put this fracture back together using serumedical technology. This means less time in the operating room, less anesthesia, less radiation, and fewer patient complications. Imagine, if you will, also seeing these same models uh, on your mobile device, again, using serumedical technology. So we, we deliver our software two ways, one through a head-mounted device like a Microsoft HoloLens, or two through a mobile device, such as an iPad or an iPhone. And our surgery enables, uh, and our, our software enables surgeons to do a number of different, different things. They can make virtual cuts. They can simulate corrections. They can measure angles, distances, volume, and bone thickness. Our software can also be used on telehealth co consultations. And in fact, clinicians thousands of miles away can simultaneously manipulate the same hologram. So we offer software as a service. The surgeon will upload our CT or MRI data to our cloud service using our proprietary technology. We'll take that data, transform it into a customized hologram, which the surgeon can download for use in their pre-surgical planning conference for a quick review prior to surgery, or to sit with a patient either face-to-face -face or virtually and go through imaging prior to that patient's uh, upcoming surgery. So this image on the left, this image here on the right, they're one and the same. We do not take doctors out of their workflow. What we're doing is replacing this conventional imaging with clearer and much more relevant imaging. Our value proposition is straightforward. We are here to bridge the gap between imaging and reality. Uh, based on our pilot study at UCSF, uh, we are projected to save over 20% of operating room time. This provides enormous cost savings and revenue opportunities for our hospital and health system customers. It also helps them to work down COVID-related surgical backlogs that St Stefano was talking about earlier. Um, I'm, I've been involved in digital health for about 15 years as an entrepreneur and business development executive. My two co-founders, Jesse and Ben, are UCSF radiologists. So that's Sura Medical. Uh, we look forward to answering some, some questions in the upcoming breakout session. Terrific. Thank you very much, Rick. Yep. Uh, great presentation. And as Rick said, he is also a digital health expert. So if you're just interested in digital health, go see Rick, spend some time with him. He can just answer your questions, not only about Sura, about digital health in general. He, he's a person I used to go to regularly just to find out what was going on in digital health. So great to, great to have the presentation, Rick. Thank you. Uh, okay, now to bring it all home, Anna McKay Sim is going to tell us about caring for patients with muscul musculoskeletal disorders or, or anything related to orthopedics in the home. So let's hear about Sword Health. Thank you so much. Can you guys hear me and see the screen? We can. Great, excellent. So I'm here from Sword Health. We are a virtual physical therapy provider and we believe everyone deserves to live a life free from pain. There are so many people in pain in this country and we're really on a mission to make that happen. We do it by virtualizing physical therapy, bringing it into people's homes and making it more convenient, more effective, more accessible and less expensive. As we know, PT is an effective intervention for people who suffer from chronic pain and is critical to recovering from surgery. All those backlogs of surgeries could potentially benefit from this. But we also know that it only works if you stick with it and adherence rates for PT are traditionally abysmally low. The truth is even before the pandemic hit, PT just wasn't working for the way that we live. It's just too inconvenient. And now if you're lucky enough to have a PT clinic that's open around you, Social distancing makes it even less likely you can get to that appointment when you need it. PT can also be expensive, and unfortunately, it's one of the least accessible types of care in this country. There are huge disparities in both access to care and outcomes based on race, gender, socioeconomics, and geography. All of this adds up, of course, to those terrible adherence rates. And when you don't stick to a PT program, you just don't get better. And when you don't get better, you end up resorting to surgery or injections or medications or other interventions that just don't work as well. So oops, that's where we come in. So SORTA's digitized gold standard PT and brought it into the home. 
We are the only solution in the market that combines real physical therapists with real time feedback, thanks to our wearable motion sensors and our proprietary FDA listed digital therapist. SORT is also the only solution in the market that works for all the major joints, and it can also be used to overcome chronic pain and to recover from surgery. Since the pandemic hit, we've also developed a pulmonary rehab treatment to help COVID-19 survivors who've been suffering from long-term lung issues as a consequence of getting COVID-19. So here's how it works. We work with employers and health plans to offer SORT as part of their benefits programs. Our members will learn about SORD through their employer or their plan, and they sign up online with an easy form. They're then matched with a real physical therapist, um, and they have a video call where the PT gets to know them and learns more about their condition. The PT develops an exercise program that's totally customized to them, and then orders them their kit. Once the member gets their kit, it's super easy to set up and they can get exercising right away. Every time a member completes the session, all of that data from the motion sensors gets into the PT portal and the PT can see how they've progressed and update their program based on how they've progressed. But we all know that great PT isn't just about exercise. Pain relief and recovery is just as mental as it is physical. So that's why our PTs are there for them every single step of the way. They provide behavioral coaching and education and support. Our program's been really easy to use and stick to. Our adherence rates are at least double those of traditional PT. And most of our members even opt to do more sessions than they're prescribed because it's so convenient and engaging. And dare I say it, sometimes fun. Um, it works. If I can move to the next slide, oops. It really works. Um, it works better than the gold standard. We've run controlled clinical trials on post-surgical patients. And those who've used SORT have recovered 30% better than the control group. Um, who had three weekly sessions one-on-one -on -one with a real PT. That is a lot of PT the control group was getting. I don't think I've ever had that much PT in my life. Um, it also works wonders for chronic pain. In our member population, we've seen a 70% reduction in chronic pain and significant decreases in both medication use and surgery intent. Of course, all of that translates to massive cost savings for both employers and plans. By reducing spend on treatments like surgeries and medications, employers and plans can reduce their total costs for MSK by about 34%, which translates into millions of dollars in savings. But the reason that I'm here and the thing that's most inspiring to me is hearing the real stories of people who are getting their freedom back, thanks to SWORD. In this picture, Sarah, her back pain was so bad that she was couldn't get in the shower properly and she never made plans because she was afraid that she might have to cancel them because she was in too much pain. Now, thanks to SWORD, she's herself again. And that's really um, so wonderful. We hear stories like this every day. They're the reason I get up in the morning. They're the reason I'm here talking to you guys today. Um, that was a super quick overview of our platform. It is very powerful and there's a lot more to learn. If you do want to learn more, please join our breakout session, which is going to happen right now. Or you can choose to email me directly at anna at swordhealth.com. Thank you so much to everyone. Uh, hi, everyone. So now uh, we will be having the breakout sessions, which means each company will get their own rooms to explain their technology in a little bit more detail. Uh, the session would be approximately seven minutes and you will be automatically assigned to a breakout room. If you have been assigned to a wrong room, uh, let us know and we will assign you to a room of your choice. Just come back to the main meeting and let us know. Also, um, we will reconvene here back in the next seven minutes to have a quick round of summary and then we will close. After the session ends, each company will be hosting their own virtual social meetings, which means it's the company's own meeting in case you want to talk to their leaders or find out more about them. Uh, these are the details that I'm sharing in the chat box one after the other. So please feel free to join their meetings. Um, after the breakout session and this entire meeting ends. So right now, we'll all be placed into different breakout rooms and we'll come back here in the next seven minutes. Thank you. Thank you. We are back. It's a- uh, I'm out of space. Uh, it's good. Well, uh, look, we, yeah, this was a great group. I mean, I think, uh, as good as it gets, four great companies. Um, I'm really, I'm super sad. This is going to be, this is the last of our uh, summer session, but uh, um, we're uh, we're going to do something again in the fall. We're, you know, at Health Hub, we're going to focus next on our uh, our awards, focus on our awards, and let everyone uh, everyone's taking you know their summer off and 
and doing everything that they need to do, uh, we're going to come back with a whole nother, another series. But what we want to do now, it's 446. We're very sensitive to time. We want to spend the next three or four minutes. We want to take a few questions uh, from the audience. So if you've got some questions, put them into the into chat. Um, and, uh, you know, Daniel, Paul, do you want to start off with the first question to any of the, uh, any of the companies? Well, I'm happy to. Uh, maybe uh, a fun one would be if you were to look at your own company or the ones that are around the space, what would you, uh, what would be your crystal ball for what's going to be available in 2025 or 2030? And um, what, do needs to, what do folks need to keep in mind with what might be coming down the pike? And the question is to who? To Anybody. The, to, our, to our presenters. Okay, great. Presenter. Uh, Rick, you're usually not too shy. Why don't you take that one? <laughs> Are we all going to be plugged into the matrix, Rick? Are you still there, Rick? <laughs> oh, Rick, 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 new is coming. reality is going to be gone, and we're just all going to be plugged right in. Okay. We'll see so, on so, so, so what's, what's coming down the pike in terms of uh, uh, our company? No, the technology in general, where do you think we'll be in the space of augmented reality and imaging, image resolution and image uh, rendition? Um, so in terms of in terms of augmented reality, I think look, I, I think there's 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 a, a lot of room for the technology without without question. You know, one thing that uh, Jesse and Jesse Cordier and and I and, and Ben Ben Laguna, our, our co-founders, take enormous comfort from, is is the fact that if you if you if you line up one of our images next to a conventional image and you ask a surgeon which you know which image they'd like to plan surgery with they inevitably are going to go with our augmented reality model. So I think, you know, we look forward to, to being able to, to roll out our, um, roll out our tech, technology. We look forward to, to, to being accepted in, in, in the marketplace. And we, we look forward to making surgery a heck of a lot more efficient than it, than it cur currently is. How did COVID, so Rick, how did COVID change everything? That's our theme here. So I know you've been working on this. You're just getting to market, but, did the inter the interest level and in what you're doing ramp up incredibly as it relates to uh, um, so 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 there is there's pretty strong interest um, again we, we we save a lot of time in in the surgery in the surgical suite um, so uh, uh, you know 28 million uh, surgeries backlogged worldwide I think in that in that same study they, they were talking about um, it would take 45, 48 weeks to work down this backlog. You know, we're, we can we can save save enormous time and help organizations work down uh, work down these these rather extensive uh, the surgeries they have in backlog. And then from a telehealth perspective, um, using um, using our software, um, as I mentioned, surgeons uh, thousands of miles away. Can can manipulate the same hologram at the same time uh, and 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 plan better surgeries again, bring bring greater efficiencies. And then in terms of uh, again on the telehealth on the telehealth side for us, um, you can you can sit with a patient and explain a, a, a surgery to a patient that much better with our with our uh, with our imaging. Excellent. We got a, a, a sword health question. So talk about uh, PTs and their ability to uh, bill for RPM. Anna, whoever was from SWORD. Megan, are you there? Do you want to take yes. this one? Oh, I'm sorry. I was trying to find my mute button. Yes. So there's several different ways that PTs can bill for this type of service. And one of them is billing as a wellness service through an insurance company. One is billing directly through an employer as an administrative fee. And one is billing more through insurance companies as a medical um, claim. And so what we've found, because mostly we're targeting right now health plans and employers, is that people are preferring not to bill that way because they want to bill for first dollar coverage as a wellness offering, which is a little bit of a different type of kind of presentation for this. So we're not experiencing that quite as much. But I do imagine that this will move, like, and that we're having a lot of discussions with people about billing this way, and I think that it will be possible. I'm, I'm so excited about what you guys are doing. Uh, having uh, spent God knows how many hours just going to PT and thinking about why I just had to actually go there. Um, um, and what Peloton and everything has done, you guys, it's, you guys, it's super exciting. Um, 
if we don't have any more questions from the audience, um, I'm actually because I'm I'm a stickler for time, and I, I think we're at our uh, we're at our limit here, and everything is recorded. And I want to I'm going to really uh, uh, summarize everything we've we've uh, picked up today, if it's okay. And uh, uh, you know, Daniel and Paul and uh, Stefano, uh, feel, feel feel free to jump in, as I know you always do. Um, but look, I think what we've seen here is that. Uh, COVID, the, our theme was that COVID really changed everything. It accelerated a lot of the development of all the remote technologies and telehealth. Specifically, in this, in this case, elective surgeries were cut off. And so the focus, again, is how do we do more with less time? How do we make people more efficient? And how do we let get people get, how do we enable people to get their procedures done? We've got, we had four examples of great companies today that really showcased a lot of that. Stefano, you did an incredible job in setting the scene, I thought, today in what's going on at UCSF, what's important in, um, in uh, musculoskeletal, what's happened and, and what the future is. And for those people who are not, uh, have not attended or any of uh, Stefano's Doc SF uh, sessions, a lot of them are virtual right now, uh, he has the best of the best um, in, in his sector talking about what is going on in his space, and I encourage you to do so. Uh, Daniel, thank you again. Your presentation was, as usual, absolutely incredible. Um, Daniel has, you could go, if you wanted to Google Daniel Craft, you would see the, some of the most incredible video presentations given in healthcare of all time. And today was just uh, typified what, what, he's, what he's able to do. MedTech Innovator, Paul, thank you for your participation in this uh, you know, these last four panels, MedTech Innovator is the leader in, in the medical device space, um, and they've really incubated some great companies. On behalf of UCSF and UCSF Health Hub, thank you. Thank you all of us. Make sure that you sign up to attend our award show. If you're a company, submit for awards. If you're, one, if you're looking for a mentor, an investor, come to our website. We're there to help you. Uh, the whole point of this is we are a nonprofit. We want to help companies get to market faster, help them scale and grow, and help them make an impact. Help them and help us, and at the same time as it relates to COVID, help us get through all this. Thank you, everyone. It, it's uh, 4.53. I promised we'd end. And uh, what a great uh, session it's been, and uh, we'll see you in the fall. Great. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Mark. Good job. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Right. Thank you. Good job, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Thank you. Look forward to seeing you guys sometime soon. Bye.